for our dessert, I'm going to do a traditional Métis bannock. So it's a recipe that my, my, my two grandmothers uh, had, and then my aunt on my dad's side and my, my mother uh, with her grandmother's recipe, her mother's recipe, brought them together. And we looked at them and realized that they were very similar, minus one little detail. Uh, one of them had cream of tartare, the other one had eggs in it. So we kind of created a hybrid version that I'll make for you shortly. But to go with that, I'm going to create a strawberry rhubarb and sumac uh, roasted uh, dish here. Kind of like a compote that will go on the bannock. We're going to treat it as a sweet, uh, sweet dish. You could also use it for savory. Uh, just omit the sugar on the top or just uh, serve it as is with, uh, with the stew. Whatever you want to eat it with there. It's pretty delicious and delectable. It goes down pretty quickly in our family. Uh, so strawberries are almost in season right now. Rhubarb I just got from my mom. She just picked that up. So what I'm going to do is chop this all together. I'm going to toss it and then I'm going to put it onto a sheet pan and then I'm going to roast it on the grill because I got it going on right now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take uh, my strawberries. They've been washed and dried. Same with the rhubarb. I'm going to chop up my rhubarb into kind of one inch chunks. So I've got 400 grams of rhubarb. I'll also include in the recipes about the amount of cups, but I'm guessing this looks like about uh, four cups of rhubarb, almost a liter, and then about oh, it'll be two cups of strawberry. So I'm going to take the rhubarb here. I'll put that off to the side. You can see I like to keep my cutting board right to the edge of the table so I can just sweep everything off to the side there. And then my strawberries, I'm going to take them. I'll use my smaller knife. I'm just going to chop off a little bit of the top. And depending on how big they are, I'll either cut them into quarters or halves. I like to roast fruit. I find it concentrates, I'll cut this one in a quarter, it concentrates the flavor. It also adds, uh, caramelizes the sugars a little bit more instead of just doing it on a uh, pot on the stove. Roasting your fruit helps to reduce, concentrate the flavors, uh, as well as, as imparting some smoky notes since we're doing it on the barbecue. Okay, so now we're going to assemble our strawberry rhubarb, a roasted strawberry rhubarb and sumac uh, compote. So I'm going to take my 250 grams of strawberries, hulled and chopped. I'm going to take my 400 grams of rhubarb, chopped up. And to that I'm going to add 100 grams of white sugar. Mix that together. I'm going to add a tablespoon of sumac. A couple of years ago, pre-2020, about 2019, we brought in an indigenous chef to TRU, uh, Chef David Wolfman. Uh, he cooks out in Toronto at, at the university. Uh, and he came in and we did an indigenous dinner. Uh, I was looking at his cookbook and he had a lot of sumac into his recipes. And I had never really worked with sumac before. Uh, so I decided that I would like to use it, but I couldn't find it anywhere in grocery stores. Uh, he said he'd bring me up some and then I started to research sumac. And then I realized my neighbors had a sumac tree. There were sumac trees up the street, kind of buries the fruit on top of it. And as it dries, it creates this really nice lemony, full flavored, uh, aromatic flavor to it. So I find it kind of goes well with sweet and savory dishes. So I like to add a little bit into uh, my dish here with my strawberry and rhubarb. And then we're also going to add a swig or a little bit of vanilla. It's going to look a little dry right now, but as that fruit roasts, liquid will come out of it. We'll get a little bit of color from the barbecue, from the char, from the roasting, and add some different flavors to it. So I'm just going to add this to the barbecue. It's probably going to take about 30 minutes to cook. I just want to stop every now and then and give it a stir. What you'll find is the liquid will come out of it and it might uh, burn in the corners. So we just want to make sure that the liquid doesn't over caramelize or burn in the corners. So turn that up and let that roast. So now I'm going to make a, a, a version of, of Métis Bannock uh, that's kind of a collaboration between two different grandmas who has passed down. So this is going to be a, a Métis Bannock, so a baked bannock, more like a, like a baking powder biscuit. And we're going to treat this kind of as a, a sweet application. So here I've got four cups of flour, uh, just an all-purpose flour, that I'm going to sift along with uh, two and a half tablespoons of baking powder. And then I've got a pinch of salt and half of a teaspoon of crema tartare. So one of my grandmother's recipes called for an egg. The other one called for crema tartare. So we're going to use one egg and crema tartare, just a, a way to 
bring them both together, just bringing both families together in one bannock. And then I've also got some sugar here as well. I'm gonna sift those ingredients together just to mix them and aerate them a little bit. And then also just make sure that I don't have any lumps in my flour or nothing that shouldn't be in the flour ends up in our bannock. I've got a glove on right now because I want to, this butter's been in the freezer, it's cold, it's a cup of butter. Uh, there's different ways that I've seen to make biscuits, so I find this one kind of works the best for me. What I'm gonna do is grate frozen butter and then I'm going to put it into uh, the flour here. I find by grating it, what I wanna do is create little layers of butter that will end up leavening, so causing it to rise and giving me little pockets of, of butter and dough there. So frozen butter, the glove just helps to keep it frozen and also keeps it from kind of slipping in my hand. But just great little chunks of butter. So I like to keep everything cold with this as possible too. So frozen butter, cold milk, cold eggs. A lot of the times when you're baking, you're using a room temperature ingredients when you're dealing with cakes to kind of try and get a nice even consistency. But things like biscuits, it's a quick bread. We want everything cold. So once it hits a high temperature, we're gonna cook these off at 400 degrees. The moisture within the butter is going to cause it to uh, leaven or expand, create steam and create little pockets within our dough. The old school way, the, the way that my mom taught me was she had a dough cutter so it looks like a little knuckles with a little cutter in it and you could cut the butter, cut the fat into it. So I still have those kicking around. I've also seen people using like a blender and then pulsing the blender. And I find using ice cold butter, you get these nice little, these little flakes and we just want them coated in the flour. And then what I have is one and a third cups of cold milk and I've got one egg crack those together so we've got our dry ingredients and we've got all of our wet ingredients here and then we will mix them till combined and I'm going to add my milk in and I'll use my fork so what I'm trying to do is just kind of hydrate the flour evenly while keeping that butter cold so with this I also want to worry about over mixing the dough if I over mix it it'll once I've added the liquid to the flour it's going to create gluten which is great when you want like a tough bread. But for this, I want it to be light and delicate. Now I'm going to use a dough scraper for this just to be able to manipulate the dough. I'm going to put down some flour and I'm just gonna bring this dough together. I know it looks really powdery right now, but as I work it, it'll come together. So what I'm gonna do Here's a modern technique that I've learned to help develop layers as well. So I'm just going to kind of pat it into a square. And it's going to be difficult at first because it's so light and fluffy and not really amalgamated. But what I'm going to do is fold the dough over. I'm going to take my dough and I'm going to fold it over like a book and just start to build layers on my bannock. This one too, fold it over. Now my dough is starting to come together a little bit more. So that was two. What I can do as well is put a little bit of flour down just so I don't lose count and then just draw lines so I remember how many times just in case you get distracted something comes up and now I'm starting to see my dough come together. Fold this over like a book. Add another line. Roll it out. Oops. Last one, last fold. You can see my dough has now really come together. That's my fifth. So now I'm gonna roll it out to about an eight and a half by eight and a half inch square. And then traditionally my mom would do it uh, with a two inch biscuit cutter. But if I found rolling it into a square and then cutting it, I can get uh, all the use out of it without having to roll it again, a second roll, which can be a little tougher as well as I find by using a really sharp knife, getting a sharp cut on the dough, uh, instead of using a, a biscuit cutter or a circular cutter, which can cause it to kind of push down, you'll get a more even rise and a nice uh, leavened product. What are we looking at? Nine by 10, just need to bring it in. This helps as well to get the shape that I'm looking for. So now I'm going to cut it 
and two. I'm going to cut off the ends, just trim off a little bit. So this is, I am going to sacrifice this, but you can also see all the layers that we've developed within the dough, which will help to leaven the bannock. So this we could uh, just bake this up, sprinkle it with a little cinnamon sugar and eat that as is. It's not so pretty, but it still tastes delicious. I'm going to cut this into three equal sections. I'm going to put these onto a sheet pan lined with parchment paper. And then I'm going to put them into the fridge just to keep that butter cold. Uh, so it'll firm up about half an hour in the fridge. So when I do put them into a hot oven, about 400 degrees, that cold butter will heat up and uh, expand, causing steam to leaven and get our biscuits to rise up. So what we're going to do is take a couple of plates. We're going to take our bannock and take my biggest, fluffiest pieces. Looks like we can see all those layers that have come and risen and given us light and flaky bannock. So I'm just going to take my hands and just break them up part because they come apart so easily. Just break them in half. And then what I will do is I'll take some of our roasted rhubarb uh, strawberry sumac compote and just place that on the dish as well. It's almost like a different version of bannock pie kind of thing. We've got our crust which is our bannock. We've got our filling. I don't think I have to worry about being too generous with the filling as well. So you get a bite of the strawberry rhubarb in every mouthful. And a little bit more there just for good luck. And then I've taken, I always seem to have a can of whipped cream in the fridge. So I figured this would be a great way just to spruce it up. I'll just put three little dots of whipped cream. And then right now we have a lot of pansies, edible pansies in our garden. So I figured just a nice garnish to add some color and texture more to brighten up the dish, make it look fresh. They look pretty, they taste exactly what you think a flower would taste like, but in this subtleness, I'm sure they'll just add some color to our dish. And there is our Métis baked bannock uh, with whipped cream and roasted rhubarb and strawberry sumac compote.